All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine and Pipeliner CRM. And today I am joined by Ruben Gonzalez, who is in Houston, Texas. Correct, Ruben? Actually, uh, oh, yeah. that's where I used to live and that's where my phone, but I'm in Colorado Springs. I, I, I couldn't stand the heat, moved to Colorado in 2010. Oh, okay. You're abs excellent. And and obviously, for what we're going to talk about today, Colorado makes a little more sense than Houston does, right? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So just to give you a bit of background about Ruben. So um, Ruben uh, did something kind of strange at the age of 21. Well, not strange in terms of he decided he wanted to participate in the Olympics, and then he decided he wanted to participate in the Winter Olympics. And you, know, you got to think at 21, if you're going to take up something, you know, maybe cross country skiing sounds like it's, it's probably difficult, but it sounds like it's not that, you know, it's not that uh, hard to take up. But instead, Ruben, you decided to go for luge, which is uh, if anyone hasn't seen luge or can't remember, it's basically where you get this tiny little bob, little sleigh with, you know, the kind of ones that you'd see in the backyard. And then you launch yourself feet first <laughs> down the down the track at horrendous uh, speeds and uh, hopefully get to the bottom right that's right it's it's really good for your <laughs> prayer life because you're praying the whole way down <laughs> so um so uh, you know 4 years later um after a lot of experience and probably some uh, some hair raising experiences and probably a few broken bones uh, you made it to the olympics um so tell me uh, let's just start at the beginning and then we'll talk about the book that you've written and the motivation that you're doing to you know speaking that you do but just let, let's go back to the beginning why on earth did you decide you wanted to do luge and you wanted to go to the olympics to do it you know i I always wanted to be in the Olympics. I saw it when I was 10 years old on TV. and But I was the last kid they picked for PE in school because I was a slowpoke, uh, a, a lot of heart, but no body to go with it. And so I never believed it was possible. And it wasn't until 11 years later, I'm um, watching the 1984 Sarajevo Winter Olympic Games on TV. I see Scott Hamilton, the figure skater, win the gold medal. And he's about 110 pounds soaking wet. And I thought, if that little guy can win, at least I can play. And he gave me belief for the first time in my life. I thought, if you can do it, I can too. And I went to the library looking for a summer sport. And it took me five minutes to realize you have to be a super athlete to do any right. of that stuff. And my nickname in high school was Bulldog because I was always very perseverant. And so mm -hmm. I thought, I need to find a sport with a lot of broken bones, maybe a lot of quitters, and I just won't <laughs> quit, right? And maybe I can use that perseverance and put it to work. And so I had it down to ski jump, bobsled, and luge. And I finally picked the luge, and I didn't even know where the track was. I wrote Sports Illustrated a letter, asked them, where do you go learn how to luge? And they said, Lake Placid, New York. And oh. uh, when I called him up, the guy started laughing. He said, you're too old, and by now you have 10 years' experience. But when I, he found out I was born in Argentina, he did a 180. He says, if you'll go for Argentina, we'll help you, we'll train you. You'll still have to qualify in the top 50 in the world, but uh, you got a shot if you don't die. <laughs> <laughs> And so I went, and a few, you know, four years and a few broken bones later, I, I made the cut, and I got to do it four times, and I'm actually working on number five. I'm, yeah, uh, I was going to say that. So you've been at four Winter Olympics, each one in a different decade. So I mean, you've got all these crazy records, and you're going for you're going for number five in uh, when is it 2020? 2022 20, 20, in Beijing. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, Beijing. I'll be fifty nine. And wow. I went back after a seven-year break uh, last year just mainly to see if my old body could handle the G-forces. You're pulling six <laughs> Gs on some of those curves. And I'm sliding better than ever. I'm mentally tougher. But they said, you've been sitting at that desk uh, writing books for too long. You're all stiff. So now yeah. rather than having me lift weights, they have me doing yoga. They said, no yeah. weights for you for two years. And just stretching out will give you access to a whole new set, of, a whole new level of strength you didn't even know you had. <laughs> and then we'll work on strength. And so uh, we got a plan. And the co and the coaches said, you got a shot. Um, I got a brand new sled waiting for me in Calgary, a German sled. And we have a plan. And, uh, you know, we're gonna, uh, that's all I needed to hear. I got a shot. You know? Yeah, and so so I mean that that's a great point. So, well, but what was it like the first? Because I mean, sometimes people dream big and say, "Oh yeah, I'm going to go do this," and then reality bites, right? And then they go, "Okay, well maybe I've overshot my dreams a little." But what was it like for you the first few times that you actually went down the luge course? Did you have any of that moment of like, "Okay, look, this was just a silly idea. <laughs> if I get off, if I make it to the bottom, I'm going home and doing something else." Did you ever have that moment? Oh, it's brutal. I hated it. I didn't. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't. I, I white knuckled it for mm -hmm. 25 years. I mean, I was that. I was scared. I did it in spite of the fear. 
because the luge was the vehicle. The Olympics was the dream. I just nice. focused on the dream. And a couple of years ago, actually a couple of years before my last Olympics, I, a coach that knew how to get into my head uh, helped me get over the fear. Right. And before they, all they said was, Ruben, you must relax. Well, how can you relax? <laughs> they never taught me how to relax. Well, this guy taught me and the fear went away and now I can focus. And um, so, yeah, sometimes it's just a little tweak, right? Like when yeah. you're making a sales call I and mean, my background was copier sales. Yeah. Times it's just changing one or two words or the uh, inflection of your voice or the or, you know, little things can, can make a big difference. So what was the what what did they how did they help you get rid of the fear? Because, I mean, as you mentioned, um, you know, you were a, you were a, a, a copy or salesperson and salespeople. You know, there is always that element of fear because you get so much rejection. It's like, oh, you know, or you're going into a huge opportunity and you're like, I, I can't blow this. How, how did they teach you to get rid of the fear? Because to be honest, if you can get rid of fear of going down a luge course, I'm sure you can get rid of fear of pretty much anything. <laughs> Yeah, and you know what? Uh, what holds most people back is uh, fear of the unknown and and fear of failure, right? Mm -hmm. And nine nine times out of ten, it's just a smoke screen. It's something that you know you were fearing something that number one wasn't going to happen, or it was something that you can overcome anyways. So it's all in your head. And so uh, my coach, he said, he asked me, uh, "What's going on in your head when you're going down the you know when you're sliding? I mean, you've been doing this for 25 years. You're still scared. I mean, come on now." <laughs> and <laughs> I said, look, man, as, as, those, as I see those walls going faster and faster, I get tighter and tighter. And by the bottom of the track, I'm, I, I'm hard like a surfboard, right? Mm -hmm. And I can't, you can't react, right, if you're stiff. Mm -hmm. He said, luge is not about speed, okay? We're, it's a sport that lives in an environment surrounded by speed, but you can be clocked at the fastest speed. But if you crash at the bottom, you still lost the race. Right. It's a, who has the best time. And the only way to get the best time is by what you do in every section of every curve, how you're steering. And so from now on, you have to put on the blinders and you have to focus on a spot 30 feet in front of you. Just shift your focus. If you change your focus, the fear will disappear. And I trust him. I mean, he's got credentials. I trust him. And so I, that night I did, oh, I probably did 100 mind runs, right? Visualize mm -hmm. run. I put on the blinders. And I just focused in front of me. The next day, I, I did it, and the fear went away. Right? Changing the focus did change the experience. And um, a lot of people focus on the wrong thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like, oh, the economy, right? Or oh, maybe next year will be better, or whatever. And, well, no, you know, the economy is the same for everybody. Yes. What you need to focus is on what can I do in the next ten minutes? What can I do in the next fifteen minutes? Who do I need to call? Who do I need to text? What relationship can I strengthen, right, uh, in order to move my business forward? And if you focus on that, you're going to leave the competition in the, in, in, the, in the dust. It's not about the economy. It's about what you do. All yeah, and, and that's a great point, though, is about uh, is almost like uh, taking it step by step and compartmentalizing, like you said, instead of if you're going for a big deal, instead of like worrying about the final piece, right, the end of it is is worry about getting each part right as you go along. And if you do that, then your chance of success are that much more um, increased, right? Yeah. And it, it sometimes uh, I, I always tell people, you know, find somebody who's already done what you want to do. You know, talk who, who's the person that's getting all those awards, all those salesmen mm -hmm. of the war of, of the month award. Why don't you go take them out to Starbucks? You know, mm -hmm. successful people, they like to talk about success. They'll tell you. And then if you start applying that information, I mean, just before I talk to you right now, I was calling this lady who was an expert in education and I have an online course that I'm about to offer to uh, to high schools. Right. Mm -hmm. and uh, it's character education and, and perseverance, et cetera, all the things that will help them in life, not just in school. And but I was asking, OK, well, who do I contact? Do I go superintendent? Do I go? Uh, mm -hmm. and, and what do I say to them? And what do you think is a good price point? I mean, I'm trying to get all this information so that when I do make my first real call, I'm prepared. If I've done that, that due diligence ahead of time, I'm going to call with confidence. I'm going to have a different tone in my voice and it's going to come across. Mm. That's uh, and and I love that. And you also, so you you've written about you've written about five books, but let's um, the courage to succeed, right? I'm interested in that because the title uh, the title can mean a couple of things, right? So what what is it the courage to succeed? Are 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 you saying that some people are actually almost afraid of success, right? They're afraid of what happens if they keep going. Just like you, I mean, were you at at one stage afraid, you know, my goodness, what happens if I actually start to get really good at this? I'm stuck doing it, right? I got to keep doing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh you have all these fears. Like I said before, you know, fear of failure and fear of the unknown hold people back, right? Mm -hmm. But 
the reason I called it the, the, the courage to succeed is because I believe that no matter what your goal is, you know, whether it's graduate from high school, make salesman of the month, uh, pay off your credit cards, lose 50 pounds, what you fill in the blank, whatever your goal is, you got to have two types of courage. You got to have the courage to get started, right? And everything's hard at the beginning because you have no skills, right? Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so you have to have the, the, the courage to endure, to not quit. Now, the courage to get started comes from believing it's possible. I mean, for 11 years, I didn't have that one, right? right. I, I didn't believe it was possible. It wasn't until I saw Scott Hamilton that I had that one. The courage to not quit, that comes from your desire. Mm -hmm. If you want something badly enough, nothing will make you quit, right? And so if you have them both, look out, right? And so the um, uh, you got to have that desire. You have to feed the, at the Olympic Training Center. They're always, uh, you know, instilling belief. Hey, you can do it, baby. You can do it. You got a, you got a shot. You got a, mm -hmm. that's what they're you got a shot, right? And they're also, uh, you know, and, and also the desire. Man, imagine what it's going to feel like. Imagine when you're walking into that opening ceremonies in Beijing, mm -hmm. you know, so it's the only city that's going to do the summer and the winter Olympics. That's history, man. Right. And the bird's nest. And so I got pictures of the bird nest, right? And I got, I mean, I'm, I'm fueling my desire because that's four years away. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. That's a lot of crashes from now. Okay? <laughs> no broken bones. But, you know, so you got to keep that desire. Otherwise, you'll quit. Yeah. And and another thing, getting back to what you were saying about that, we can always find excuses to, to not do something or to quit or we can find excuses for our for our lack of success. And, you know, you mentioned like, oh, it's the economy or it's it's the industry I'm in or it's my company's marketing strategy or whatever it is. But I watched I was telling you earlier that I watched a video of you in the ice rink in Houston. Right practicing nowhere near a luge course right you're in houston for goodness sake you know you couldn't get further away from winter olympics if you tried right but you were in an ice rink practicing launches right so you were using whatever was available and you didn't care what people thought i mean i'm sure people were like what the heck is that guy doing over there i mean oh, a lot yeah, of people would have just gone oh this is too embarrassing but you but you used what you had right yeah and in houston and houston's flat and there's not no not even hills over there <laughs> And so I would go to a um, uh, one of those multi-level parking lots, right? Mm -hmm. And on a Sunday when there's no cars, and I would take a sled with wheels, and I would just zip down those those uh, those ramps, and then I had to break, otherwise I'd hit the wall at mm -hmm. the end. But I, you know, I, whatever it takes, you know, uh, you got you got to do what you can with what you have today, because tomorrow may be too late. Right. So when there's you're... always somebody out there that's tr that, that's that's training their tail off, right? And, and so you, you're competing against yourself, but you're competing against them too. Yeah. So, I mean, so one of the messages, uh, obviously, that you have here is go and, you know, find, you know, what it takes and work with what you have and don't let those be limiting. Right. Because we're very good at, as I said, with coming up at self-limiting beliefs. Yeah. Yes. And you have to surround, you have to create your own dream team. I mean, I have coaches, I have mentors, mm -hmm. I have people that have already been there. I mean, I've got coaches from all over the world now. They all want the old man to do it. Right. <laughs> I mean, in bank, it was it in Salt Lake City. I was 39. And most Olympians are in their 20s. It's right. like the college, everybody's in shape. But back then, they were asking me if I was a coach. I said, no, I'm an athlete. And I said, oh, come on. And, and the next one was Vancouver. I was 47. They thought I was coach's dad. I'm actually older than a lot of the coaches oh, now. My goodness. Yeah. <laughs> hey, what, what, what if I make it? Wouldn't that be great? And, you know, it's the record right now. It's a 98-year-old record back in the 1924 Olympics. The Swedish curler. Uh, he was, you know, did it, right? Mm -hmm. it, well, I don't want mine to last 98 years. Sure. I want mine to last four years. I want a bunch of athletes out there that have been sitting around to see me and say, man, I'm already good, you know? Mm -hmm. but I think I'm going to get back in the arena. Wouldn't it be great if – Four years later, there's a bunch of old guys out there. I mean, how cool would that be? Yeah, no, that would that would be that would be awesome. I mean, I, and I think there's such a, and I think it would be such a great message as well because I mean, we're we're I mean, as you know, I mean, we're bombarded with pop culture and. <clears throat> everything around youth and it's almost like i mean nowadays if you're not an instagram star by the age of 13 or 14 your life is over right you know forget <laughs> it <laughs> yeah, no you're right you're right no and, and, and it's uh man there's so much there's so much more yeah. you know and, so uh, so what made you get into then into motivational speaking why did you decide to go into a, a career like that as well it was a, a total god thing i mean i i was a copier salesman and about a month before I went to the Salt Lake City Olympics, this little kid, little fifth grader in my neighborhood, he said, hey, Ruben, when you come back from the Olympics, will you be my show and tell project in school? <laughs> I said, sure, why not? And I pictured, you know, 
show and tell, right? 20 kids, they're all showing something off. You know, I'll be in and out of there in five minutes. Mm -hmm. I took the sled, the helmet, the Olympic torch, because I was a torch bearer. I thought, no prisoners, I'm going to finally win a gold medal at something, right? <laughs> I'm so happy. I go to the school. Principal takes me to the auditorium. There's 200 kids sitting on the floor, and he says, you got 45 minutes. Have at them. <laughs> and they turned it into an assembly, but they didn't tell me. I thought I was going to die. <laughs> I've never taken a speech class in my life. Uh, believe it or not, I'm an introvert. I mean, I can turn it on and off, mm -hmm. which salespeople should be able to do that. Yep. Professionals in any field mm -hmm. should be able to turn it on like that, right? And so this is not Ruben, okay? This is public Ruben. This is stage right. Ruben, right? Mm -hmm. But I'm Clark Kent. I turn into Superman for an hour up on stage, and then I'm Clark Kent again, right? And so um, that kid, well, after that talk, the principal, he said, you're better than the people we pay. You need to do this for a living. <laughs> And I said, what, you get paid for show and tell? <laughs> I was clueless, right? He said, no, man, it's a speaking profession. Don't you know anything? And he was so in my face about it that he got me thinking. And I thought, you know what? If I can sell a copier, I can sell a Reuben too. Mm -hmm. And I started hitting the phones. And I built my business cold calling. Mm -hmm. For the first year and a half, I would call every school, the principal, the counselor, the president of the PTA, every school in Houston. And I joke with them. I said, hey, I'm up to the P's. What do you mean? Oh, because I started at the A's and see your, your school starts with a P, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but I, that's how it started. And then it became more and more uh, businesses started hearing me, about me, I guess. And since my background's in sales, gosh, I'd say almost half of my, my presentations are sales kickoffs for big corporations. I mean, mm -hmm. ha, believe it or not, I've spoken for over 100 of the Fortune 500 companies and it all started, you know, this kid asking me to do show and tell. So, yeah. uh, but it, but but that's another fantastic example. I mean, and I think your life is uh, is full of these examples of. I mean, that's a fantastic example of an opportunity that you have to be open to opportunities because you don't know what they're going to present, right? I mean, you could easily have gone, uh, you know, I don't want to do the show and tell. You know, I don't want to go into your classroom. But being open to it and it, it's opened a whole other world for you, right? You have to be open for opportunities and you have to be creative and don't try to be perfect, right? Mm -hmm. Just try to, you know, get out there and do it. Um, you know, Dunn, well, my first mentor in speaking, because uh, after a few weeks, I was I was broke, right? I knew how to mm -hmm. tell some stories, but I didn't know what I was doing. So I found a guy that had been in the business for 12 years and he was successful. And so he agreed to coach me. And he said, first thing he ever told me was, uh, unless you write a book, no one's going to take you seriously because an mm -hmm. author is considered the authority of his subject. Right. He wrote the book on it. I told him, I can't write a book. I made C's in English. Mm -hmm. And said, hey, you got a great story. You write it down. We give it to some A students. They clean it up. That's just, yeah. just grammar. I said, wow, I didn't think about that. He said, yeah, it's called editing. So shut up. He said, <laughs> But he said, you know, don't try to be perfect, Ruben. Perfectionists don't ever get anything done. Mm -hmm. Just throw mud on the wall. Some of it's going to stick. We'll clean up the mess later. And eventually, uh, I see you got the big CRM behind you. I can read it on your yeah, sign. Yeah. Well, he says, you got, you, of course I, I use a CRM system. I didn't at first. I didn't know what it stood for. Mm -hmm. But you have to. You know, we're contacting people. It's not just that first contact. It's being professional and following up, right? And and having a system that that that, that helps you out because there's so much data out there. And so that's a tool, right? Yeah. And so create a dream team, use tools, and work your tail off. And then people start saying, you were lucky. <laughs> yeah yeah well you know what they say the harder you work the luckier you get but yeah i love uh, these people saying wow you know overnight success and you think yeah overnight success 25 years in the making oh, yeah, or whatever yeah. oh, it's so true. <laughs> um so ruben um in the last few minutes uh we have here i'd like you to tell people a little bit more about how they can find out more about you and and how they can uh you know not just from your motivation speaking your books but how they can follow your uh your quest to make it to uh, Beijing. Sure, sure. Uh, probably the, 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 the most value you can get is if you go to Ruben, that's R-U-B-E-N, Ruben Tips, right? Like you give somebody a tip, mm -hmm. rubentips.com. That's just one page in my website. And it's a place where you sign up. I've got a bunch of articles that you can actually click on and read, right? And if you like my style, and it's usually a story followed by a point. And they're all short articles you can read in five minutes if you like them you can sign up for the newsletter and it's free and i don't sell anything i just i just want to give people back some some of the stuff that i learned along the way and then you go across the top then you'll be able to see other parts of my website mm -hmm. where you see videos and and testimonials and uh who knows maybe maybe you want to bring me in to you know to pump up your folks so uh my goal when i speak to a group is 
I want him walking out thinking, man, if that guy can go to the Olympics even one time, we can do anything. Yeah. See, if I do that, then they believe, right? Now, if they believe, they're ready to take action. They're starting, they're ready to call that chicken list of people. <laughs> they, they weren't going to call them till they were successful. Well, guess what? You got to call them to become successful. Yeah. But, you know, they believe. And so hopefully it, I can do for them what Scott Hamilton did for me. Right? Yeah, then, love it. Love it, Ruben. Listen, this has been fantastic. Um, I'm, you know, it's it's been so interesting. There's so many great messages. Um, I completely admire you for what you're doing. I'm I'm going to follow your your career now, especially follow you uh, and watch and see how you get on for Beijing. I think it's fantastic. I hope you uh, break that record. And you're right. I hope a bunch of other people break the record after you. That's right. That's right. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for having me. And it, it's been a pleasure. Yeah. My name is John Golden. Says Pop Online. Says Magazine Pipeliner CRM. And I'll see you all again for another expert interview really soon.